Hello, all. We'd like you to join us for an adventure of hilarity in the world of business. We are the two wizards, and we have a microphone, and we have an opinion. But that's not why you're here. You're here because you want to know how to have a better game. And that's kind of what we talk about here. I am Shane. And I am Andrew. And he has way better lighting than I do today. <laughs> yep. Nope, my lighting is terrible. But, Until uh, the sun goes down, and then I might have to turn some lights on. <laughs> that is true. Uh, it is the changing of the weather and the changing of the tides. And we have a bunch of stuff we'd like to talk about today. But is there any update on the Kickstarter? I got. I do believe I received a message myself saying that something had arrived. Yes. Uh, books are arriving all over the world. And uh, Shane's book is right here in this very office. Excellent. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the, there's really two main messages. One, the Monsters of the Dungeon books are arriving. Uh, there's still some that are being shipped. Uh, we're also sending out the extra things like the monster stickers. And um, then for the World of Mirror, the editing is getting close to being finished. It's probably another week or two, and that will be complete. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, both projects moving along. Uh, the dungeon book nearing its conclusion and the mirror book getting closer to layout. That is kind of exciting. Actually, it's way more than just exciting. I mean, I'm jazzed. I'm pumped. I have, uh, I'm excited because I want, I want it. I want it now. Just give me whatever you got right now. We'll just, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> well, you know um, what you have is I have piles and piles of the monster stickers that are getting mailed out. Nice. So, I'll just show you. So here's the uh, Armored Griffin oh, from the awesome. Monsters of the City. And then we have the Swarm of Chessmen from the new dungeon book. Nice. And of course, we have to have the Demon Snail. Well, it's a rule. It's the rules. Because that's so, actually in a t-shirt. Is that correct? These are all... Demon... We'll have all of these are going to be... Um, on a lot of different merch, like books and T-shirts. And um, there's the Night Steed from the Underworld book. Oh, I love that one. Um, yeah, so those are going out to Kickstarter backers. And then soon we'll open up our store. Um, so you'll see a lot of different options that people could get as well. Nice. I actually, I realized I only have a West of the Wood shirt, or uh, I think it was a West of the Wood shirt. I don't actually have any monster shirts. I should probably get one or two. Yeah. Which, by the way, you could buy on worldofmere.com. <laughs> yeah, right now, actually, we just we just opened up the, there's a drow spider rider uh, image. So that is available. And then we're going to open up the other pages shortly. And we have a lot. Um, there's probably somewhere between 10 and 20. I can't remember exactly, but. Yeah, a lot of different nice. options. That's awesome. Yeah. So you sent me some videos over the past uh, few days that made me laugh, um, made me cry almost. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you want to tell people about what uh, what seems to be going on behind the scenes uh, at, Wir at Wizards? Well, yeah, there's some interesting news today. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of the game. And it was supposed to be a big celebration this year, which a lot of other a lot of third party companies are doing. Like we really made our monster our dungeon book as part of that anniversary year. And the official company said this year we're going to bring out new books, core books for basically update an update of 5e. But what's happened is the player's handbook is going to come out in September. The Dungeon Master's Guide is supposed to come out in November uh, now with this new schedule. And only next year will the Monster Manual come out. It won't even be out for the 50th anniversary, which this obviously was not their original timeline. Um, and there's also a video with Joe Mangiano, which is making the rounds, where he comes out and voices his displeasure because Dragonlance looks like it's dead on arrival. So he'd written a script. Oh, no. Yeah, he'd written a script for a movie. 
and he'd been working with the official company and the original authors, Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss, but that's all gone now. They don't want to have anything to do with Dragonlance, apparently, according to him. And he also said that ever since 5e got rid of most of the original team, it has been heading heading downhill as far as the official company. And um, many people have said the same thing in terms of the quality of the products. And uh, you could see he was being quite diplomatic, but he it seemed that he was quite upset about all of these developments. And much of the original team, much of the team who knows how to make the books and knows what the game's about are gone. Now, I he didn't talk about this, but are they gone because they were told to leave or that they just decided it was no longer worth uh, being there? Or or do we know? I mean, we, it's well, possible. Well, I do know. know. I do know for from personal, from firsthand, I have firsthand knowledge of people who left because they didn't like what was happening there. But I also know, but then the, the reason why people ended up being laid off or let go, I have no idea. That's, you know, I'm sure there's NDAs and nobody yeah, really course, yeah. talks about that very much. And I'm not really interested in that personally. Um, well, no, I mean, that that's true. Cause it, it just comes down to being like a gossip fest or, Hey, yeah. you know, maybe wizards can start up a reality show, but their inner workings. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I go back to what I said in the OGL controversy last year, like that company has the, has the name, but we have the game. We don't need, we don't need, you know, we don't need anything more. We have the 5e basic rules. We have all these resources from all the, the through the years. We have third party companies still making products. We don't need that uh, corporation. Well, exactly. And that's the thing that they, I mean, it was obvious last year with the whole uh, OGL thing um, that the, the ownership at that point didn't know what they had. Mm -hmm. It's like they just treated it like any other product. And I mean, there were issues apparently quality wise with uh, with uh, Magic the Gathering, yeah. uh, which then sort of trickled down to 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 Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And in that last year, I mean, you're right. They they really should have been going, guys, we have a 50 year old IP that we really need to respect and actually say, hey, Next year is good. It was 50 years of D and D. We should be doing like activities. We should be having like cons or something or some sort of, you know, come and play D and D in the biggest party ever, like 700 players and one DM. It'll go totally crazy, but you know what? It'll eventually work. You know, something nuts like that that would have actually you know, brought attention to the game. But I mean, I was actually surprised at Joe's commentary. Like I, he's been as you pointed out, he's been kind of mum he's like very very quiet about his sort of opinion and he would make little jabs here and there that people could pick up on but um but i liked his candor I liked him being very honest about uh what he felt and the people he's spoken with and and now i guess uh, the uh, about two three weeks ago we started hearing about potentially somebody else coming along to purchase the uh company i don't know how true that was uh, have we had any developments in that respect? There's been a lot of rumors, but uh, I mean, the main company that owns the company that makes D and D, the big corporation, they're they're yeah. not doing well. They haven't been doing well for a few years. I mean, without Magic the Gathering, they'd be in huge trouble. Um, that yeah. that game is making them so much money. So, yeah, we don't we don't know, but I think you know. It's it's a possibility because of the situation with the company. Um, I know Mangiano said in that video that he offered to try to buy the Dragonlance IP. Uh, he'd had lined up some investors and and they weren't even interested in selling it. Um, I know there's people who's ta who've talked online about Elon buying D and D or buying you know buying um, Wizards. That would be something. Because the mob um, of virtue signalers would lose their minds. Oh God, yeah. 
I mean, that's that's all definitely part of it. I mean, all of this stuff going on is just it does not paint a, br- a bright future for what's going on because they've missed their opportunity. Already. I mean, it's only February. Maybe they'll pull something out of the out of the hat uh, by the end of the year to say, hey, d and is kind of important to a lot of people. And uh, we've crapped all over them and we've made yeah, sure well, they feel unloved. But Well, we haven't seen what this updated 5e is actually the end product is. So we'll have to see that true. to be able to actually comment on it. Although I, you know, I can't see, well, I mean, there's no, I don't know anybody who's interested in buying it, but we'll see um, to, you know, to make any comment on, we'll have to see what the final product is. But as I said, we don't need we don't need that company. Uh, hopefully, it turns things around. I mean, the smart thing would have been done. The smart thing would have been to make a classic edition, and then this new thing, whatever they want to do, that would have been great because then the, you know, the hardcore original fans would have been could have been satisfied. They could have kept the original Five E team around. But they've gone a different direction. I mean, it's still possible it could get turned around again. Somebody else could buy it and clean house and start over um True. but in the meantime we don't need them like we just made 700 almost 700 monsters and now we're making a world book and uh there's lots of small companies doing good things and um you know hopefully that continues i do too i i am saddened by everything going on and i'm trying to remain to be positive about it uh but it's it's hard uh, for something that that we've loved since you know we were children. I mean, it's kind of like uh, I don't know making a Ghostbusters movie that we didn't need because of a poor script. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, moving along. Well, that um, means that's just part of uh, you know the agenda of the studio. But uh, that, that's what I mean. Like yeah, this the game the really parent means- overlord it yeah. mistakes what D and D what their fan base is like. But this doesn't have to change our game. Like we just played on Sunday yeah. and, you know, just a bunch of goofballs sitting around the table throwing dice and um, playing with little miniatures. We're not, it's not, it has no, what happens in Seattle or LA? It's not, it's not that important. Actually, so. that is actually a very good way to think of it because you're right. We don't need, we already have the stuff. We already know yeah. how to play. We don't need anything else. Um And if we have improvements that we'd like to make, we can make them at the table. Like it's not, it's not a real big deal. Yeah. And if you want to buy a new world setting, there's world of mirror. Want to buy some monster books and then soon we'll start making adventures. So you're all looked after. Yeah. So, uh, you can play 40 years from now. We'll be thinking about how Kaywood was such a man. He was brilliant, man. He made all these great things, made D and D what it is today. (laughs) You can, uh, you know, you can, you can do it yourself. You know, there's a lot of, you know, once we get adventures going, you know, it's, uh, it's all there. Someday, I think you should make one of those, uh, what are they, like the books that are basically one dungeon, like the Uber crawls. You mean like a mega dungeon? mega dungeon kind of idea yeah. i've i've never played one i don't really know i've never done right one, but, right but what if, if you made one i would do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah we could definitely do that sometime um yeah i've never really done it well actually i guess i have before you started we did do a couple of really large dungeons but since you've joined the group we haven't done any massive dungeons like the last adventure we just did was two sessions in the dungeon right right so mega dungeon is usually a bit more than that. Yeah, I, I mean, I gather that they're they've got their own story, and there's all kinds of weird stuff going on that actually makes it interesting. And um, but again, I, I've never done one, so I don't really know how their their mechanics work. Right. But uh, but yeah, I think it'd be kind of fun to do it in Mir. So uh, that said. What adv- what adventures should we be talking about today? Because otherwise, we're going to talk about the uh, sad things going on at Wizards for the next hour. So uh, you have some thoughts today about uh, what we should be discussing. Let's jump into them. 
Yeah, we're going to look at different tiers of play. And um, and actually, when we make our adventures, we'll divide them into these three tiers. So all each adventure, you can, you'll be able to run for low, uh, medium, or high level. So today, we'll look at low level. We talked about this a bit because we talked about how, how much fun it is to start at low, low levels because yeah. there are a few people now who just decide to start at third or fourth level. So low level is really in 5e and um, many of the additions is sort of about first to fifth level, first to fourth. And um, it's a lot of fun because you have a new character, obviously. There's a new backstory for this character. You're equipping this, equipping them, you know, with their um, tools and things they'll need for an adventure, their spells, their weapons and their armor. And um, you have a new campaign with a new story. You start meeting new NPCs and, you know, it's a great beginning. This is the beginning, yeah. you know, it's like the beginning of a series of movies, right? So um, the stakes are high because your character is not very powerful. Although 5e, the, the PCs are stronger than the other editions. And um, it's very simple and straightforward. You don't have a lot. It's not complicated because... There's not a lot of spells. You don't have a lot of attacks or features. So, you know, it's a really good level for new players to start at, obviously, and even kids, um, if you have an age-appropriate kind of story. And it's, uh, again, it's simple, simple combat. Again, you don't have a lot of attacks. You don't do a lot of damage. And right. um, sometimes simple is better. And um, you have basic spells. And you have to be strategic because... You know, even a fight with a giant rat could kill your character, which is fun. Or a series of fish. A series of fish, yes. <laughs> the, legendary, the legendary one quipper who lasted several rounds against Shane and the, most of the party. Um, you also have very basic traps, so they can't do a lot of damage, but it's fun because you don't have a lot of hit points, so even a basic trap could kill your character. So there's a lot That's of something that people don't recognize. Like at that level, you're right. That that low level stuff. I mean, I get. Hey, when I'm level one, I'm legitimately nervous. Yeah. Yeah, and you there's, should. Be. There, I I I'm looking for death in every corner, and yeah. uh, and it could come, and you're not you know realizing it as well as you should. Yeah. No, and you should be definitely. I'm just adjusting my light here because the sun is starting to go down. <laughs> All right. So you can still see me. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when the stakes are high, that's one of the reasons the game is fun. And um, they are not higher any other time, I mean, than first level. Uh, it's, you know, it's the most dangerous time for your player, especially if you're a wizard. I mean, original first edition, the maximum amount of hit points you could have, I guess not including your modifier, was four. You had a D4 for hit points. Like, you could get, you know... I mean, if that quipper just spat at you, you'd be dead. <laughs> right? So it's it's fun when these stakes are high and you you have to be strategic and be careful about where you're going and make sure the mage is in the back and you know people who have low armor class is not near the front and like in in the adventure we were just doing through the dungeon, you made sure you either had the paladin or the bard who's got a decent armor class lead the party. Actually, you weren't there on Sunday, but that's what happened. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I love I love low level. We talked about how it's so much fun. Some examples, a simple dungeon crawl. You just mentioned a dungeon crawl, which is what our group did the last couple of weekends. Helping out a village, that's often a, you know, a very common archetype. Uh, a missing person needs to be found. A simple rescue mission, like, um, you know, someone's being taken from your local area and you have to go to the dungeon to rescue them or a cave or the woods or something. Um, finding an item, like a magic item or something that's being taken or something that's, or the item's location is being discovered. Um, a haunted manor is a classic one. And then cleaning out an area of monsters like a cellar or ruins is another kind of simple story. And um, 
There are many famous low-level adventures. I have a whole series here. See if you recognize any of these, Shane. All right. So we'll go alphabetically. So one of the most famous is the Slave Lord series. Yep, the Slave Pits of the Undercity. Yeah, this is A1, the um, the first one in the series. So that's a lot of sort of, a, that's basically a dungeon crawl. Um, and it's not too tough. It's got some nice traps. I won't tell you what they are exactly because some of them are pretty fun. And it's a good starting out adventure. It's got a quite, quite a cool variety of monsters. You know, it's not just undead or, um, so that's a good one. Another, another one, this was actually the first adventure that I ever did. Keep on the Borderlands. Yep, that's actually the first one I did too. That is a classic starter. Classic, yeah. So it has a it has a dungeon crawl sort of in a castle to start, and then you move to the wilderness, and then you end up being in caves. And that's a good, really good uh, starter adventure. It's a good one to look at just in terms of writing an adventure too. Another one which is good for really low-level characters is the Forest Oracle. I've never played that one. Yeah, so that's a good one. I love that look. These are all first edition um, AD&D. And then the White Plume Mountain. White Plume Mountain. My, one of my, actually probably, I would say probably my top two is White Plume and, and oh, two wow. more well, White Plume, it's uh, it has traps like Tomb of Horrors, but it's not as deadly, and it's more of a crazy fun house. Um, it's got a good story. There's some really cool magic items. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. It's and these most amazing. of these are not very long. You know, you're talking a dozen or two dozen pages. You know, and then the classic Village of Hamlet. Yep. yep. So once again, you have. Uh, some dungeon crawl elements. Uh, you've got a small village, obviously. The title kind of gives that away. Um, and it gives you a good idea for a DM of what what a town would or, or a village would be like. And uh, it has got a good variety of creatures. And it's not it's not a it's not too tough. There are some tough ones. Like I I didn't include the I think it's called the Tomb of the Lizard King, something Lizard King, Cult of the Reptile God. That's the name of it. That 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 one actually is quite tough for low level. It says it's a low level adventure, but it's pretty tough for low level. Here's my one of my favorites from one of the ones from of England, course. from uh, the Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh. That's a series of three, and it's a really good starting point because again, you have a little like settlement. And then you have rumors of a haunted house and you have to go and investigate. So it has good elements of mystery, a good variety of creatures, and it leads into two other adventures. Um, so those are all official ones that I would recommend for low level. Our one real, we have actually two low level two or three low level ones there are some that are part of our adventures and mirror series you can get on the on drive through but my favorite is actually the rogue knight which is on the dams guild and you can find that link on our website too i really like that one and that one is built for low level and it has um some wilderness elements and some um, elements in a settlement and a variety of creatures so, and I, yeah, I like the story. That's one of my first stories I came up with when I started coming, when I started playing 5e. So those are some good adventures. Um, some examples of creatures. So in the official game, the core book, of course, you have things like orcs and goblins. Although an orc, you know, with a battle axe is pretty tough. Um, right. You might want to do that maybe second or third level, not at first level, because a D12 <laughs> damage could potentially kill any, <laughs> any, any character. You're dead. Oh, you're dead. Yeah. Oh, you're dead. The dice are killing it tonight. <laughs> but to change that, you could give them slightly weaker weapon. You could give them a short sword, for example, or a dagger. Goblin is a really good for, for 
one for first level. And then you have things like mimics and oozes. Um, the gray ooze, I think, is the lowest level. Although we have a bunch of oozes in our book as well, in our books. Yeah. Um, yeah. Things like bandits and pirates are good because you can have you can adjust the hit points quite easily. Um, animated objects are a good one, like armor that comes to life or flying swords or the deadly um, carpet, the rug of smothering. That one, again, I would say for probably <laughs> second or third, because it might it could quite easily kill a first level character. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, things like zombies and skeleton, a lot of low level undead creatures are good for first level. Um, scarecrows, lizard folk, and Sahagwin, if you want to have different kinds of creatures. Um, lizard folk, you know, are more in swamps, obviously, in caves where Sahagwin are coastal creatures or, or in the ocean. Um, things like blights and carrion crawlers, another good things for like low level. Slightly tougher wolves um, are good for low levels, although right at first level, I might. You know, I might only have one or two attack the party. Um, but they're good for, some of these are good because they're very easy to put almost anywhere. Um, a rust monster is a great one because it threatens, you know. One of if my you favorite lose, creatures. Yeah, if you lose a weapon at first or second level um, or your armor da is damaged by, you know, one AC point or two, that's significant. Um other ones that are slightly tougher, like a baby dragon, a wormling, um, like lycanthropes, like weir rats or weir wolves, um, ghouls and ogres, and ankhegs. Ankhegs, quite low level creature, can ambush people on sort of grassland areas. So right. that's some examples of some monsters, like low level kind of creatures that won't wipe the party out, but are, that are fun. And of course, quippers, of course. <laughs> yes yeah i was gonna say we can't miss the classics that try to kill us every time we play that's right <laughs> then in our books we have a number so in Feyland, monsters of Feyland, there are of course the famous doubt trout which a lot of people have heard about Doubt that is my favorite creature because it took me by surprise and I basically was, I mean, I was almost killed because not by the, the, uh, doubt chart, but because of what it, what it did. And, and we've talked about that before about, it's not always going to be such a direct comparison. Like if you are or a direct uh, conflict with the thing you're running into, that right. it could do something. Cause that's how Raven died. Uh, when I, when I first got back into playing again, uh, my character died because of, you know, people just couldn't get to me because to help me out because of, you know, the creatures are grappling and blah, 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 everyone else. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's the, um, then the rain man, which you've talked about in our last episode, the rain man's in here. That's not really high level, <laughs> but oh my gosh, is it totally frustrating as all hell. <laughs> yeah. And, um, we've got the log shadow is a good one for really low level which transports people in the woods without their um you know they don't have sometimes they don't have a choice it just teleports them through the woods um yeah. the gremlin uh, which was inspired by those gremlins obviously um in mythology that sabotage things and then we have a tribute to the internet troll and hater uh, which is the hater monster in here um they're a really good low level uh, creature. Um, they're very obnoxious, and um, of course, they have vicious mockery. So that's a that's a really good one. And there's also the Boggart. Um, I would say at second or third right. level is a really good low level creature. Um, it takes the form of what the party fears, um, and in some stories, like in the Harry Potter story, it's often talked about as an indoor creature, but actually in folklore, it's usually a wilderness creature. So that's what we've okay. that's what we've made. In Feyland 2, you've got the lunatic, which you haven't dealt with yet, which drives people crazy. And uh, the pumpkin bat, which can breathe fire, a flying um, jack-o'-lantern. 
Um, the gingerbread man is a very fun low-level creature, and um, the baker fairies as well. And um, for slightly tougher creatures, the bookworm, which can devour books, and if they have um, spells on them, it actually gains the power of the magic spell as well. Um, and the gale snail, which is a flying snail creature, which can shoot rays of fire from its antenna. <laughs> <laughs> you have way too much fun trying to kill uh, other people's characters <laughs> you gotta do it you gotta try um all right in the underworld book monsters of the underworld we have the boom slung which is um modeled after south african snake but this is a giant version of it uh poisonous snake the germ nice. worm which could spread disease and i'm always i was inspired by those creepy little um Creatures that crawl into the character's ears in Wrath of Khan. <laughs> they make people more suggest uh, uh, sub suggestible. Yes, yes. Right. And the, the, uh, the demon snail is in here, which is a crazy creature. The careless whisper, um, which is this creature that whispers horrible things to the players. Um, and the draugr, which is actually from folklore, but most people know it from... Skyrim, and it's an uh, undead um, creature. And then uh, slightly tougher, the Toadstool Fool is a, a fun one to play with characters um, and toy with them from this book. Then we have the a Monsters of the City. In here, you've got things like the Puritan, you know, sort of modeled after yeah. Shane. That's right. That's me yeah. right there. Um, the Anxious <laughs> Apprentice, which is a a kind of uh, clumsy wizard, young wizard. Um, you've got the outraged, which are a modeled after the um, the internet mob, um, which is in here. Yep. Uh, the quag, which are made out of dumb guy fungi from the underworld, the, these strange uh, mushroom creatures, and then slither kelp, uh, which I always remember because I asked my wife. I said something like, "What's better?" For a monster the it was something to do with seaweed like the it wasn't a good name anyway i said something seaweed or slither kelp and she said oh you got to go with slither kelp so it's a I kelp like see. creature that slides out of the ocean and then attacks creatures and devours them and then slips back into the water nice and then we have <laughs> the ale ooze which um likes to wander around uh, taverns and go after um, the sort of, you know, the people, the stragglers at the end of the night. Nice. Of course, you don't have any experience of that, and neither do I. No, never. Nope, nope. I don't know what you're talking about. For slightly tougher creatures, I would recommend the hothead, which is basically just somebody with anger management issues. Um, yep. And he's sort of like a mini miniature version of the Hulk. Um, and there's also the very creepy Twins and Needles who's in here. Yeah, that we've encountered that character uh, a couple of times. And, or actually, no, 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 no. Actually, no, there's another twin set from uh, a different book of, your, of yours. Twins and Needles, and there was another one uh, that I can't think of at the moment. Oh, yeah, Twist and Shout. Twist and Shout, thank you. Yeah. So the Wilderness book, you have the Odd Sod, which are these really strange creatures that um, can actually get the party lost in the wilderness, which is quite fun. Um, you've got the murder hornet modeled on this crazy hornet that's out here in the Northwest. Um, the screech leech. Um, the trow, who are actually modeled after the original drow idea, which are these fairy creatures. The undead pirate. Um, and then for slightly tougher... Um, Adventures for slightly like for third, you know, for third level, maybe fourth level. We've got the crazy jackalops, which are jackalopes with a cyclops eye. <laughs> um, we've got the crystal spider, which was inspired by that giant spider in the Mandalorian on the snow planet. Right, right, right. Oh, which yeah. Is, I, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. And it, we actually have a swarm of smaller versions, just like they had in the TV show. Um and then you have Selkies, this famous creature from mythology. They're in here as well. And the Wave Rider, this weird fake creature who can 
It's basically like a, imagine a surfer fey creature who didn't need a surfboard and could just surf the waves. Yeah. Nice. And then the last monster book of ours is in terms of low level creatures, the new book, the dungeon book, there's the earworm, which I just used when you were away on Sunday, uh, which nice. torments people by singing songs over and over. Um, there is the Illuminus, which appears as a severed hand holding a lantern going through the darkness. Oh man, ah, I, I, ah, that's one because that was one of the ones we talked about briefly a few right. weeks ago. I and then you one. have the scare case, which is a, a staircase that's actually alive, sort of like a mimic. Um, the dungeon crawler, which can smash through stone dungeon walls and ceilings and floors. Um, the flying skeleton and the house it, which is a very obnoxious fairy creature. So those are really low level. Ones that are slightly tougher are the sewer snake, which you just fought, which almost killed the party. And that was when your party were third level. And that was only one sewer snake. So there's a sewer snake. There's the throne of lies, which you decided cleverly not to um, sit in. Sit in. Um, there's the apprentice necromancer. There's the pillar of the community, which seems like a pure pillar, but it's actually a, a monster. Um, there's the shady characters. There are the swarm of chessmen, which is one of my favorites. Uh, they appear to be little chess pieces, maybe, well, bigger than normal. And they actually can come to life and attack you like a swarm of creatures. Uh, yeah, so that's that's a good summary of some of the low-level creatures. And um, I absolutely love low-level play. We've just done an adventure where the party now just got to fourth level and it's a blast because, like you said, the players are careful of what they're doing and everything means something. Getting your first magic item, you know, getting, you know, if you find 10 gold, it's like, oh my God, I found 10 gold pieces. Later in our campaigns, I've had players who completely ignore any copper or silver that I give out because that, you know, they've got 2000 gold already. Thank you. They were going to ignore copper, silver, electrum. The only thing they're interested in is gold and platinum. <laughs> and that's pretty sad because at, at later levels, especially in the adventures that, uh, that you run, is that you eventually have characters that are banded together to actually like run a castle yeah. or a fleet of ships. And you actually delve into the to the detail, not, not like... Oh my God! We've, okay, we've got to get like a a book for everyone to keep track of their uh, their double entry and uh, you know make sure you've got you know paying your taxes right. Like it's not like that, but it's you actually say okay, well you have you know twenty five people that you're that are guards yeah. at your place and uh, you have to pay them, you know otherwise they'll leave. Uh, yeah. And just stuff like stuff like that that is kind of nice. Like somebody to take care of. I think in the floating castle there were griffins that had to be cared for. Uh, stuff like that where. It could so easily be ignored and taken for granted that oh yeah we've got a castle and guards and stuff yeah okay well here's a reality pick up those copper pieces or pick up those things because uh, you need to you know invest time in it or or sell your castle that's another option yeah you know like little things like that of just the reminder of that these are the responsibilities at a higher level uh, that the I mean we chose to maintain a castle we chose to have a fleet of ships. We chose right. as as a party that this is something we wanted to do. Right. But it kind of it just makes it so it it cheapens it if we just have okay we have a castle. Yeah. You know, and, and it gets left at that. that. That's just that's lame. Uh, the characters really need to to as I always say I like the breathed in the breathed in the lived in uh, you know world and uh, you know these little minor details uh, are kind of important to keep that to keep interest right so. Yeah, to make it a bit more immersive and a lot of new dungeon masters, one of the one of the early questions they will ask as their players get or the characters get more powerful, maybe the players do too. Um, <laughs> as the PCs get more powerful, they'll say, you know, what do I do with all the gold they have? Well, there's a lot of ways to spend. There's lots of ways that you can have the players spend their money or lose their money. 
Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about that more when we do medium and high level. But uh, yeah, like you say, there's upkeep, there's hiring your, you know, your hirelings. And uh, so, you know, at low levels, you better start, you know, in my campaigns anyway, you better start gathering that money because you're going to need it. Because <laughs> if you don't, uh, the opportunity to do something that you really want to do that requires some sort of gold investment by you know the players um it's kind of important you kind of want to you want to allow that low level player or little of a character to be able to sort of think forward in time to be like okay well i'm level this but if once i get to level that i can see that i get this type of uh thing that that might actually benefit me uh to gain something uh because we should all be at low level and actually any when you're playing your character you should always have a character idea that that what is this character going to be at level 10 what's this level character be at level 15 and and how impactful how important is that because depending on your background depending on you know any choices that you make for that character like i don't know every time they see undead they have to go kill it uh you know these kinds of elements sort of inform you of how you should save your dough uh maybe that magic item you got yesterday is not going to really benefit you you find a different one that complements your character better there's all these sort of little things that that i like that uh, i think should really be considered by players not necessarily the, not necessarily the person running the game i think that that you can always drop hints you know that, hey don't forget about that or don't forget about that but it's really ultimately the 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 i don't know the, the 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 gravitas of playing as a low level character that i think gets could get ignored but that's just me yeah it's it, so. um and i think it's fun when you're you know deciding you know if you don't have a lot of gold too you have to figure out, okay like your party the adventure you're in right now they're just buying rations because they've r almost run out of rations and uh they could only buy a certain amount and uh, some characters had to buy rations for other characters because they because they basically run out of gold and and we yeah. play with the um, the encumbered the varied the um, uh, the the variable um, encumbrance rule so in the player's handbook so that it makes it more realistic about what you can carry so people in the party were trying to figure out you know who should carry this and how much more can I carry and and actually, we decided that day too that the the weight that they have listed for rations is a bit a bit much. I think it's something well, especially, like especially yeah, it was like it's like five pounds per. No, it wasn't that. Wasn't but it, it was something, two pounds of ration or something? And we decided yeah. okay, let's make it. We were surprised. Yeah, we thought that's a bit much. Let's make it one pound, but it still is significant. It still means that. There are a couple of people in the party who are right at their maximum. And if they find anything else, like even a sword, one sword, right? Or one magic item that's heavy or or one or two more, um, you know, rations, they're going to have to give it to somebody else because they can't carry it. Yeah, because I think people, players get too dependent on, on the bag of holding as a perfect example. If you have yeah. a bag of holding... Uh, you just think it's infinite. And I know that wasn't this particular adventure we're doing, I've forgotten which one it was, but you actually, we found uh, bags of holding, but they had a limit and they, they, were, like, they were small. They do have a limit. And yeah. we started playing like they were infinite. And you, at some point I remember you saying something to the effect of, uh, well, you can't fit that in there. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, why can't I jam this elephant into the bag of holding? It's like, well, because you can only carry uh, 100 extra pounds or whatever it was. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's that's and that, I think, is one of those lazy things that I don't like where it's like, oh, well, you know, it's like um, you're playing a game like uh, Starfield and uh, you get all this stuff and you either take the time to actually go, OK, well, do I need this? OK, I don't. Yes. Or do I want to keep it? And, you know, organizing it and stuff like that. Like any game, video game is like that, where you have to do basic management of, of resources and right. storage and things like that. But in D&D, &D, because you're not, there's no, 
you know, game rule saying, sorry, can't carry that. You are now encumbered. Uh, right. D and D has those same things. And I think are really important that, that, uh, that that sort of stuff is played to a comfortable level. Like I remember playing encumbrance back in the day and it was just, it was like, why am I playing this game all the time? Because, you know, it just became difficult to manage when you're 10 years old. You don't quite understand why this is a thing. But um, anyway, the uh, elements, little elements like that, especially at low level, is, is definitely something that is um, critical, I think. Yeah, well, you shouldn't that. Yeah, you shouldn't be getting I, I don't think you should be giving out bag of holding. <laughs> I mean, at least till close to 10th level or, you know, after 10th level yeah. early on, it kind of takes things, you know, it makes things too easy. I mean, it, there are, but there are sides to it. Like it can carry 500 pounds. So it can carry a lot, yeah. um, but we were at a point where, and it can carry 64, a volume of 64 cubic meat, uh, cubic feet and <laughs> cubic meat, <laughs> maybe cubic meat too. Um, but uh, somebody was pouring like thousands of gold pieces in there and eventually it was full. Um, the other issue with it is that it does actually weigh 15 pounds, regardless of what's in itself. it. Itself. Oh, it wow. It weighs a lot. So, for example, like there's at least two out of the four people in your current party, maybe more, but I know two of the four could not carry a bag of holding. They would have to get rid of some stuff because of its weight. So it does have some boundaries and... I definitely wouldn't uh, have it in the treasure until, you know, like I said, close to 10th level. Um, well, because I, I like the, um, in the player's handbook, you actually have all the reminders everywhere about, about how much things weigh and how much your character can carry and all that kind of stuff is, is I mean, to me, it, it becomes fun. I mean, can it be tedious? Sure. But is it actually going to impact your play? Yeah, totally. Especially when you have a character, as you said, like, I know you guys won't be able to carry this particular object that you need or might want, but you're going to have to get rid of stuff or you're going to have to, like, just wait until you're at a higher level. But uh, so you might have to walk away from stuff like that, which is, is really hard for a player. But at the same time, it, it is makes it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, I remember once you had a higher level party you were probably 10th level and you were fighting bullywugs in this castle bullywugs and lizard men and they found a bunch of treasure at the party it was mostly copper pieces and silver pieces there might have been some gold but it was in the thousands and yeah. they realized that there was no way they could carry it i mean back in first edition you would have just carried it out because you'd run into treasure chests with like 5,000 gold pieces all the time. And people would say, oh, I just, you know, take that out of the dungeon. You find another chest with 2,000 gold. Oh, I take that too. But there was no way the party could carry it out. So what they actually decided to do was bury it underneath, um, underneath the castle. And they planned to go back at some point. We'll see if, we'll see if that happens. But <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me probably not. But, you know, I mean, I remember uh, not too long ago, sometime last year, we actually found, uh, we thought it was a trap, I think. There was like two chests or three chests. And it turned out it wasn't a trap. But I don't think we were quite ready for what was inside. Like we found like a whole bunch of copper, a whole bunch of silver. I don't, I, there was no gold, I don't think. Uh, I think the most expensive stuff were gems. And we took the gems, but l we walked away from the, the that particular uh, treasure because it was just there was no way to move it and didn't we and there was an adventure a few years ago where we had like a floating floating something like a floating like a cart well uh, I think... you had you had donkey who you had this donkey oh, who had, right. uh, the ho levitating horseshoes who floated along and you just well he was your pack mule <laughs> literally yeah, it was just dump he, that he stuff in along, there right? and keep it yeah yeah. But I mean, that's the thing is that you can get creative either the DM or, or the player level, especially the player level, I think, to solve those kinds of problems because uh, sometimes you just got to let go. And uh, because you're going to find treasure somewhere else. And, you know, those copper pieces, there's 15,000 of them, but, you know, is it really worth it? It's kind of like pennies. 
<laughs> we don't have them anymore because they were just so frustrating. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the decisions you have to make at, at say, what, level one through five are going to be so different from five to ten and, and higher. So... Yeah, I think beauty, you know yeah. once you get to fifth level, you're in fifth and five E. You're pretty pretty strong. Even third level, not too bad. But that first to fourth level is you know the really hard area, time to get through. Uh, and you do go up in levels quickly then, which is lucky. <laughs> That's the way yeah. it, what was designed. Those people who are now was those people who are now gone. But the game was designed properly, you know, like that. So yeah, yeah. And it kind of makes you really pay attention as a player to pay attention, because I think that uh, as long as you're getting friendly nudges from from the DM, I mean that's that makes all the difference for keeping the players honest, uh, not just oh yes, of course I've got thirteen arrows when you have like two, and uh, you know think oh the DM won't notice. Well, actually, <laughs> they don't tend to keep track of that, but eventually somebody goes wait a minute how have you got mm -hmm. seven you just fired 17 shots how many arrows did you have mm -hmm. oh my character sheet only says five well um bad you and uh you lose a level <laughs> the spirits came down and said no anyway we've been talking about this for uh almost an hour so uh i think that uh, we should wrap it up there and because uh, it's it's dinner time when we record this and we're hungry but uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and everyone for watching. And of course, uh, we do this for fun to make sure that you guys have a better game. And uh, of course, sponsored very kindly by this little company called Kaod Publishing, which of course you can find at Kaod Publishing, worldofmere.com. And if you don't buy everything that Andrew has made and his team, shame on you. Shame on you. Go buy it now. But uh, yeah, any final words before we say goodnight? Um, just that first level is, like I said, a blast. And, you know, I think if you're skipping, you know, the first first two levels, first three levels, you're actually missing one of the best parts of the, of the game. Yeah, because boo on those who do that. There is, it's well, important because we... We I think we ranted about this a few months ago about the about the skipping levels one through whatever and and uh, I just it's just so sad I think I think that that it's fun to be scared it's really fun to to be really concerned that your character is going to not survive an encounter and that's what the next that's what your backup character is for <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but thank you everyone and we'll see you all next week thank you so much good night. Later.